would suggest to you that maybe you come visit. You know, pick a bench, relax, kick back, enjoy the park that's here, sit up on the cement amphitheater and enjoy the fellowship of the Spirit. For we assemble ourselves together in order to learn, to study, and to apply the Word of God. But more than that, really what we want to do is ask questions, find answers, and talk about Jesus. As a matter of fact, one of the best things we would hope for, that we have this confident expectation about, is for Jesus himself to come walking in, to sit down, as it were, in the favorite seat, and to share with us his word, to explain to us the meaning behind what it says in in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now I like that, because in John 1.1, 1, 1, it makes me, makes me think of creation. It makes me think of the, in the beginning, God. It makes me remember those things that God has said He has done. And when I sit outside, when I look around, when I enjoy the breeze that comes up from behind me from the north, or from my left, off the Wasatch Mountain Range or comes off the Great Salt Lake Basin or from the south, then I'm mindful of the things of the Spirit. I'm considering, as it were, what Jesus said, that the wind bloweth whither it will. You don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. So too is everyone led by the Spirit of God. And I like that because being led by the Spirit of God, 1 John, the same John that wrote the Gospel of John, the same John that we've been talking about all day, he wrote in 1 John, this letter that he wrote to one of the churches and to one of the people. He said that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Well, I like that. I like being led by the Spirit of God. I like going whithersoever the wind blows, and as the expression goes, so does Michael. It used to be said of me that once the wind was blowing, then I would go. And sometimes that was true. You know, I would minister or go somewhere or God would lead me. Sometimes it wasn't true. Sometimes the wind would blow and it knocked my house down. Sometimes the circumstances in your life may be the same. But all day today we've been talking about and looking at, in the Bible, in the Word of God, in that place that people have put a number and a name on, that have separated and segmented out certain portions of Scripture and called them by a certain number and name, we've been looking at John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, as is commonly put together in the book that we call the Bible. Now, the Bible really is just a book. I don't know if you realize that, but... A lot of Christians will tell you, well, it's it's the ineffable, or it's the in, it's always accurate, it's never got an error, it's error-free. Well, that's not exactly true. It's one of those ideas that they know that they've heard somebody say, and they don't want to argue and debate like theologians do about what part may be added or what part may be subtracted, because after all, the Catholic Church has a part of the Bible that is not included in the Protestant Bible. And the Protestant Bible is things like the King James and other Bibles like that, Schofield. And you can argue and debate if you want to about all the different translations, all the different interpretations, and try to make up for yourself some kind of application of how you want to make your Bible fit and someone else's not. I got news for you. Any Bible and every Bible God can use. Why? Because it's just a book. It doesn't matter what book it is. If God decides to use it, suddenly it's inspired. And that's what it means to be led by the Spirit of God. That's kind of our theme today at 2 o'clock as we look into the Bible as the Word of God. As we look at John chapter 1 verse 1 that says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. I want to look at the Word of God and treat it as the Word. Now we 
know that Jesus' title is called the Word of God. We know that Jesus' title is called the Word. We know he's called the way, the truth, the life. Well, to put it bluntly, whenever you want to hear from God, all you got to do is ask Jesus and Jesus can tell you. Because frankly, that's what he does. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and is ever living to make intercession for us. He talks to God daily for our benefit. He is discussing our life with God his Father. He is applying those things that he has sent the Holy Spirit to us to comfort us and to not leave us as orphans, but to instruct us in the way we should go. And that's what makes the Bible different than any other book. The Bible, if you have the Spirit of God, becomes the Word of God. That's different than a, a book of Jeremy, or a book of Levi, or a book of Mormon, or a book of Dianetics, or a book of Scientology, or a book of books, or any other book. No matter what book you pick, the title of the book of life, you know, so the book of Satan, whatever, it doesn't matter what the book is. The fact is, only with the Spirit of God, only with God's Spirit Himself, with the Holy Spirit in a person, reading the Bible, can that book become more than printed words on a page. Only by God's Spirit giving a man eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit of God would say, can that Bible actually become the Word of God. Without the Spirit of God, it's just a book. It's just a written record of the history of mankind as it's been recorded for us and kept through the centuries. It has accuracies and it has inaccuracies, but even the inaccuracies are accurate because as we examine them, we find the Spirit of God makes application of them and they fit. The reason why we can say that any Bible fits is because it's God's Spirit that does it, not man's Spirit. If man were in charge, he'd take out all kinds of parts and pages and pieces and play this part against that part and argue about it in theology and discuss it so much that he'd get disgusted and quit being a Christian. And in fact, that's what a lot of theologians do. They quit being in relationship with God and they are related to the intellect and the intelligence that they get from their own inspiration of inspiring themselves with their intellect to criticize and to be critical of that written word that the Bible it's called as a book of books that God's Spirit can breathe life into and make into the Word of God. They do not come to that conclusion. It takes a fool like me and someone without the education to come to the realization that it's God who makes His Word stand out rather than man making it all about some kind of inductive study. I'm glad that you can induce it into yourself, but without the Spirit of God producing in you fruit, then the induction does you nothing. There is nothing good about an inductive study unless the Spirit of God is doing it in you, with you, on you, and for you. Because you can work it as you know you can. You can put down all the outlines, all the criteria, all the observation, the inspiration, the application, and you can come up with seven others more than just those three and still not induce in yourself a change of heart or a change of mind. You will not be different than you were the day you started reading it unless, unless the very Spirit of God that breathed life into the men of God that wrote down the Word of God to give to us about Jesus, unless you have that same Spirit, you will never understand the Bible, for it is a spiritual book, and it must be understood spiritually. It must be allowing the Holy Spirit to show you and apply to you His Word that is God speaking directly to you as He chooses to reveal Himself to you. So that's why we're looking at John chapter 1, verse 1, as in the beginning. You can't go any farther in the beginning without there being the Word. And with the Word, you must have something else, the Spirit. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That means that you have to have God with you. It's the only way to have God with you and for you to survive, because God is holy. It's for His Spirit to be with you. His Spirit inside you. Being that appreciation for our sins. Being that redemptive quality. Being that remedy for that thing with which is in us, which is corrupting us from being in a relationship with Jesus Himself. There's always a separation.
separation between sin and righteousness. There's always a separation between light and darkness. There's always a separation as east is from the west. Unless you're standing at the North Pole, and whichever way you go, well, we'll talk about that. But the point being this, when you finally come to that realization that it's not about you doing it, but about His will, His way, His heart, His spirit, His ability to change you, then you'll humble yourself and acknowledge that you can't do it, but He can. And that's why we look at, in the beginning, was the Word. What was the Word? Well, the Word was pretty simple, to be honest with you. Every Jew knew, in the beginning, God. That's where you begin. That's where it ends. That's where it's going to always become a reality in your life. In the beginning. You'll either acknowledge God or you'll reject God. And if you acknowledge God, then God will give you His Spirit and breathe life into you. You will have eternal life for you. An existence that goes on beyond this age of grace, beyond this age of time span that is of mankind, but it will go on throughout eternity from ages to ages to ages to ages life that continually goes on. Not as a reincarnate, which is absurd, that's a deviation of what the realization of the fact of the truth was from the beginning of creation that God has said, and then mankind has changed according to the book of Romans. In the beginning when they knew God, they changed the image of the incorruptible God into the image of corruptible man and came up with reincarnation. The same way that a lot of religions are all deviant from the actual one true God, the living God, from what God has done, from what God has said. That's why it's not about Judaism, and it's not about being Jewish, it's not about Israel or being Israeli, but it's about being in relationship with God Almighty by way of His provision for us to have a relationship with Him through His only begotten Son, Jesus. And if we do have that relationship with Jesus, then He introduces us to the Father and asks the Father to give us His Spirit so that we could exist in eternity so that we could understand the things of the Spirit, so that we could be born again. A lot of people run around and use that word incorrectly. The nature of being born again isn't just simply being born from below, but being born from above. It doesn't simply mean to be born of the Spirit, it means to be born also from above, of that Spirit that comes from above. For He which has come down has revealed to us the truth, and that's Jesus. For God sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you should have eternal life. You should, you could, and you would if you choose to follow Jesus. But that's your choice. You don't have to, and you can go to hell. Because that's what will happen. But in John, as he being a mystic, he already knew what the Word was. The Word was God. And then he began to add something to it. He said the Word was with God. Whoa! Now we get something interesting. We begin to see an application of what God is saying. That it's not just simply in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This isn't a simile. This isn't a metaphor. This isn't some kind of like, change the Word from Word to Jesus, and it fits. No, this is talking about a literal word. If you use the word Jesus, then it's interesting that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, whether it's the valleys above or things below, but everything, whether height or depth or anything that has existence, all will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's interesting. What is the word that would cause us to do that? Jesus. And at the name of Jesus, the Gentiles would trust. It is interesting that the name that supposedly is ineffable, that can't be spoken, the yud heh vav -Hey, actually is God is salvation. Jesus has in his name the name of God. So the word really is something that goes beyond our just simple application of trying to make it fit in a practical way. It's something that's spiritual that goes beyond us in a way we don't understand. When God spoke, he said, let there be light, Bingo! What happened? There was light. When God said, let there be separation between the waters and the land, and the land sprung forth, and it happened. In other words, when God speaks, things happen. When God says a word, 
when it's the Word of God, things happen. That's what John is trying to imply here. That is what John is stating here. That's why John, in a mystical way, is making us understand that there's something more to this book, something more to this Word, something more to this reading of this simple verse that meets the eye. There has got to be more because he quoted it from creation. He quoted, he quoted the same words that are used in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. And then he takes and makes it into John chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning. And he says in the beginning was the word. Everything in Hebrew is always a phrase. It's never one word. One word sometimes means a phrase like my name. My name is Michael. Michael means is like it done to God. Now, it's interesting that one word could mean a phrase, but that's what makes application of why the word was with God and the word was God. There's a phraseology going on here. There's a implication of there being more to just this one word than simply meets the eye. In the Greek, the Greeks use the word word if they were, meaning one word. If you said a word, they got seven different ways to say one word, and they want it to be very specific. Hebrew doesn't do that. In Hebrew, a word can have a variety of meanings and application, but it always means a phrase. It's part of a thought process. One word is not enough. It is a phraseology or a, well, a phrase. Yes, I can't think of another word for phrase or synonym for phrase, but it simply means that it's a definition of a statement that's being made. It's not just one word. And that's why he says in the beginning. In the beginning is a phrase of a word. We had a sheet, if I remember right. I may be correct on that one, so I may be in trouble. But if I remember right, we had a sheet Yudevate, or we had a sheet Yahweh. But the point being is this. When we are reading the Bible, that's a good thing. Intellect Stimulated, intelligence, challenge. People that don't understand the Bible, well, you know, they're not going to get anything out of the Bible. People that read it aren't going to be a part of it. People that want to get something from it probably won't find anything in it. They'll discover philosophy, they'll discover theology, they'll discover laws, they'll discover history, they'll discover statements, they'll discover facts, they'll discover archaeology, they'll discover a lot of things, but they're not going to get the Word of God spoken to them. In other words, this book is not enough in and of itself. It's not enough in and of itself. This book by itself can do nothing. You're just going to become, as one of the old Christian writers said, a religious prick. I don't know what a prig is, but it doesn't sound good. I personally think that it's a stuck-up person. I'm pretty sure that's what it meant in the King James day when they had prigging. But that prig, being a person who was so conceited, never got the message of being as simple as a little child and accepting what was being said. So, when we understand that we have to have something more to understand the Bible, to make it real in our life, then we don't just induct it, we ask the Spirit of God to teach us. And that's why sometimes, no offense to those who are preaching, you know, inductive Bible study, no offense to those that are, you know, reaching out to, you know, people that don't understand how to read the Word of God or to accept it as God speaking, no offense to people that, you know, really want to be in charge and teach more and make more people dependent upon them. I want you to be independent. I want you to have a personal relationship with Jesus. I don't want you to follow me or any church or any person. I don't mind if you go to a church. I don't mind if you go to a person. But you have to have inside you the spirit of truth. Otherwise, you will be misled by anyone with good intentions. Lots of people have good intentions of starting religions in order to change what they thought was an error that happened in the church. I know a very famous state I live in, Utah, that that's what was supposedly happening, is that someone came along and said, hey, they got this all messed up, and I'm probably pretty confident what they saw they were right about. They did see things that were pretty messed up about the church. Always has been, always will be. If you follow a church, you'll be pretty messed up. But the difference is, is that 
when you have the Spirit of God, when you ask God to breathe life into these words you're reading, when you ask God to fill you with His Holy Spirit, then you have God teaching you and not man. You have God reaching down from heaven and filling you with the ability that you don't have the ability to do, which is to comprehend the things of the Spirit. We're to lean not on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge Him so He can direct our path, because we have a tendency to not think first and ask God for wisdom, but rather to do our own thing and think about it later and then say, God, forgive us for what not we did not do, which is what James said to do in the first place. If you lack wisdom, if you don't know, then ask God. We're told every day we should be walking and talking and thinking and existing as though God were speaking and whispering in our ear. And every day that's a reality of what God said He is near. He is near to those that would call out unto Him and even to those that are of a broken and contrite spirit. Those that don't have knowledge are wiser than those that do. Because they know they don't know and they ask God for wisdom. That's what we must do when we are approaching in John chapter 1 verse 1. We have to, as it were, all day long, begin in the beginning, as we were talking about in the sunrise service. Where did you come from and where are you going and have you gone the wrong way along the way? Because you probably have and you don't know that today you could hear His voice. Today you should be hearing His voice and today you should know His will. God should be revealing to you every day what His will is for you to do that day. If you haven't developed in that personal relationship, that's the choice that you've made that somewhere you've gone astray. And usually it's because of at the beginning, in the beginning was the Word. And you didn't do what the Word said, what God had said. Maybe you weren't saved. And so we prayed at the sunrise service that whether you're saved or not, whether you're backslidden or not, whether you're in a church, whether you think you're righteous or not, all need Jesus. And we prayed at the second service that we would learn that John, being a mystic, he had gone from transformation from one glory to another, starting off as a fisherman, starting off as a young man, starting off as the youngest son, starting off being influenced by peer pressure to follow in the family tradition, and yet doing as Judaism had said, to take one family member and send them to the religious schools to learn from the rabbis, to understand from the sages, and take that wisdom back to the city, back to the local community, back to the individual people that were there that John knew that he could talk to and he could share with of his own friends and his nature who had seen him and then recognized there was a difference. And that's what the Jesus movement was like. And that's what we learned in the second service, John doing that and discovering that there was more to being someone who would condemn the world like John the Baptist and not being like John the Baptist that John probably followed after, but being like Jesus who came later and he saw Jesus come to John and he said there's difference between John who was baptizing and Jesus who humbled himself to be baptized by John. We learn that we need to humble ourselves and we need to submit ourselves one to another to become lesser so that others may become more. And so the reality now that we're studying is that we have to learn that we have to yield ourselves to that Spirit of God leading us, even if it means walking away from the mega ministry, like a Mark Driscoll or a Bob Coy being done unto us, forcing us to do that, or choosing by being led by the Spirit of God at the height of our ministry to say, that's it, I gotta go do something else. Let those whom God has anointed and appointed to go direct and be in charge of that and see how they do. Because you see, it's not always about simply taking and making yourself into being the megastar or the superstar, but rather it's about taking that ministry that God has given to us by His Spirit and allowing the Spirit of God to lead us, to direct us, to instruct us, and to show us the way we should go. Because that's how we know that we are the children of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. And as long as we submit ourselves unto God, then it's up to God to direct us. For it's not being belligerent against the church, it's filling the church with each individual who all are accountable one-on-one -on -one with God. And then all of us together coming to the unity of the body of believers, coming to the unity of the faith. There's nothing wrong with going to church as long as you're doing your church at home. When you come to church, you have something to give, not something to get. You have something to 
benefit the body of believers as you come together encouraging one another, praying for one another, singing to one another, and helping each other in these times that we live in. That's why it's not a book, because it's a Bible, and that's why it's not a Bible, because it must be breathed life into by the Spirit of God. We must be born again of the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. In order for John chapter 1, verse 1, and beginning with the Word and the Word was with God, to become the Word becoming God, God's Word for us, we have to have, as it were, the Spirit of God speaking it directly to us and making it fit for us. We have to be inducive and inducted by God Himself. I'm sorry, but a lot of men and women don't. They choose to go inducive and inducted to themselves. Praise the Lord, I'm glad. You're very intelligent. Self-taught, self-made, self-directed. But you see, if we submit ourselves unto God, then it's no longer our will, but His will be done. It's no longer our way, but His way. I can't read this every day and come up with the same answer, because guess what? Every day, God may say something different to me that day. God may wake me up in the morning and say, Hey, Michael, today I want you to teach John. Tomorrow he may say, I want you to teach James. I don't know. But I don't know what God would do if I said no, because I know that by His mercy, He saved me. And that sinner that I am, as we talked about in the second service, I like to acknowledge this in regularly throughout the day today, that I am the chiefest of sinners. I at times have said no to God, and God has said, fine. And then like a Mark Driscoll, or maybe like a Bob Coy, or maybe like you or me, we suffer the consequences. The consequences of not being led by the Spirit of God are pretty obvious. They're pretty simple. You will fall. That's it. How far you fall is how high you rise. So the higher you rise, the greater the fall. So the question would be whether or not you want to yield yourself to the Spirit of God as He gives you a still small voice, as He inspires you by the circumstances in your life, as you pray and ask God to lead you in the way you should go by reading the Word, as you study in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, then I would say to you, if you're getting a Word from God, that is the Word. The Word is, the Word is with God and the Word was God. But you can't apply that, except that God applies it to you. So what does that mean to you? Well, that's what the Spirit of God's job is, to tell you, to teach you, to instruct you, to reveal to you. Jesus said it, the Word, I am. He said He was God and He was the Son of God. That his, He and His Father were one. The reality of that should shake us up. It should make us mindful of something that we don't understand, that the only way we can comprehend is by the Spirit of God. We must choose to use something beyond what we can see, touch, and feel to understand how this book can become, for us, the Word of Life, the Word of God, the Word itself, the living Word, to be, in fact, God Himself. So when God speaks, I know, that things happen. When God speaks in creation, light came forth. Water, separation, earth, mankind, breathed life into dust, became fashioned a woman. I know God did these things. The question we have to ask ourselves as we're looking in the Word of God, in the Bible, when we read it, when we do it, when we act upon it in some inductive way or some subjective way or some topical way or some memorial way or some dictatorial way like some pastors are or some Moses Moses influence kind of, you know, leadership. Personally, you know, I don't understand this mosaic leadership principle because frankly, I don't think Moses was the best leader. I like him as a leader, he's okay, but guess what, you know, the Moses idea was that, you know, he laid down his life for the, the people. I'm not so sure that pastors do that. Whenever somebody tells me they're a Mosaic pastor, I want to go, great, show me when you're going to lay down your life for me, because if you haven't even called me, I got news for you. You're not a Moses. Moses knows and I got the noses to show you. But the point of it being is simply this. When we do ask God for His Spirit, when we do pray that God would fill us by the Holy Spirit, when we do yield ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit, then we are the sons and daughters of God. 
Now, we did talk about in the second service how you're not a Christian if you're not Christ-like. But I got news for you. There's something better than being a Christian. Yeah. There's something, an inheritance we have yet to attain to. There's something glorious that's on the horizon that we are going to be a part of. And that is the inheritance of the saints, it's called. But it's becoming a son or a daughter of God. We've been adopted, but we haven't fully realized that adoption yet. The papers have been drawn, the price has been paid. We have yet to be brought into the presence of our Father and accepted as the brother of Jesus, as being those sons and daughters of God that God will say, Hey, in you I am well pleased. Now, it's not going to be because you did a great job. It's not going to be because you were so wonderful, but because inside of you was the very nature of Jesus that was brought to fruition, fruition by the Spirit of God. That means that the Spirit of God taking this Word, putting it inside you, has caused peace to grow outside of you, has caused love to grow up inside of you, has caused joy to be manifested through you, that Wherever you go and however you are, the love, the joy, and the peace are things that are happening in your life. And as you continue to see them grow, then you know. If you see them lessen, then I got news for you. You need to learn a lesson. Because if you're lessening of that Spirit of God in you, then you need to ask God to fill you and to be filled with the peace, the love, and the joy, or you won't survive the time that you live. Or you'll fear mankind, or you'll fear Ebola, or you'll fear politics, or you'll fear other things. But as far as the Word of God is concerned in John, John was writing these things so that we would understand that it is about the Word. But the Word has to have life breathed into it by the Spirit of God giving us understanding, and giving us the ability to see it, and giving us an ability to understand it, and then the ability to apply it. For except that God knew it, man cannot do it. God does it, it will stand the test of time, and you will be presented fallen before the Father with exceeding joy. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Receive the Holy Spirit now in Jesus' name.